Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, just before we begin, I'd just like to let you know if you are uh, in the standing room in the back, uh, we thank you for coming. Just make sure that you do not block the door uh, so that we can allow people to enter. Thank you very much. My name is William Barbie. I am the Speaker's Director of the William F. Buckley Jr. Program here at Yale. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's debate between Mr. Elbridge Colby and Professor Timothy Snyder, titled, Resolved, the U.S. should prioritize Taiwan over Ukraine. Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to say a few words about the Buckley Program. The William F. Buckley Jr. Program is the flagship program of the Buckley Institute, an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We have hosted lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, and an annual conference every year since 2011. Our over 700 Buckley Fellows hold a wide range of political beliefs, but they are all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley program has become an institution on Yale's campus and a symbol for a more open and representative political atmosphere. Especially at a university, where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website at buckleyinstitute.com. I also want to emphasize the Buckley Program's commitment to freedom of speech. Disruption of an event is not consistent with Yale's policies on free expression as outlined in the Woodward Report. I would ask that each of you respect the right of our speakers to be heard and the right of your fellow audience members to listen to the event. Thank you for joining us in upholding the value of free speech. Now for our guests. Elbridge Colby is the co-founder and principal of the Marathon Initiative, a policy initiative focused on developing strategies to prepare the United States for an era of sustained great power competition. A graduate of Harvard College and Yale Law School, Mr. Colby served as the deputy, the deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Development from 2017 to 2018, where he led the development and rollout of the DOD's foreign policy plan known as the National Defense Strategy. His work has focused heavily on shifting U.S. foreign policy away from Russia and towards China as their global influence continues to grow and conflict over Taiwan becomes more likely. Mr. Colby's work has been featured in countless publications across the globe, and his most recent book is The Strategy of Denial, American Defense in an Age of Great Power Conflict. Timothy Snyder is the Richard C. Levin Professor of History and Global Affairs at Yale University and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. At Yale, he teaches at the Jackson School of Global Affairs as well as the History Department of Yale College, where his recent courses include The Making of Modern Ukraine, Eastern Europe since 1914, and Hitler, Stalin, and Us. A specialist in Central and Eastern European history, Professor Snyder has also written extensively about contemporary politics and the importance of maintaining democracy against authoritarianism. His books include Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin, On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century, and The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, America. I hope you all will join me in welcoming Professor Snyder and Mr. Colby to the Buckley Institute. <laughs> I'll just briefly uh, run down the format for the event. So we will begin with five minutes of opening remarks from each speaker. We will then move to approximately two minutes of rebuttals uh, from each speaker which will then go into a 30-minute or so dialogue uh, Q&A with the audience. And then to close, we will have three minutes from each speaker as closing remarks. So we will begin in the affirmative with Mr. Elbridge Colby. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And special thanks to the Buckley Institute and uh, to be able to debate Professor Snyder on this important issue. Yes, the United States should prioritize Taiwan over Ukraine. Why? Well, let's set the context. U.S. foreign policy should first, foremost, and above all, be about protecting the American people's security, liberty, and prosperity. The greatest threat to those interests is that another state could gather so much power that it could undermine those goods. Given America's size and natural defenses, only a very powerful state that dominated its important neighbors could agglomerate so much power. As a rule of thumb, we can use GDP as a metric, productivity at scale, 
leads not only to economic leverage, but to military strength as well. So what is the country that America most needs to worry about? Well, America's roughly about a fifth of global GDP. The only other country remotely comparable to that is China, which is also ab about close to a fifth of global GDP. Russia, by contrast, is one-tenth of China's GDP. Iran, in, in turn, is a fraction of that, as is North Korea. So by deduction and evidence, um, China is the state America most needs to worry about. Moreover, China is run by a communist party that avowedly seeks to greatly expand its influence and upend the international order to its advantage. So the danger is far from speculative. Don't take it from me. Indeed, the Biden administration itself names China as our top strategic competitor. Yet China alone cannot hope to dominate America as it lacks the requisite power advantage. So how could China gain such power? By dominating its own neighborhood, Asia. Asia is set to become the world's largest market area, 40% or so now and above 50% over time and growing. If China could dominate Asia, it would be the hegemon and gatekeeper of this, the world's largest market area, and thus dominant over our national life here in America. Now, is this a realistic possibility? Yes, Beijing has structural incentives to gain a, a secure geoeconomic sphere, and China is roughly half of Asia's GDP and occupies a central geopolitical and geographic position in the region. And it's building a military to project dominating force throughout the area. So how can America stop this from happening? Well, by leading an anti-hegemonic coalition in Asia built on countries with shared interest in preventing China from dominating them. America must lead because without America as the cornerstone, the coalition would be too uncertain, weak, and unwieldy to stand up to a country as strong as China. Fortunately, this coalition is actually already forming. Meantime, China's attempts to use soft power and economic coercion to break this coalition apart and gain ascendancy in the region have manifestly failed. Unfortunately, Beijing has another option, which is military force. This effort would likely be focused on Taiwan. Now, why is Taiwan so important? For two reasons, primarily. First, if Taiwan falls to Beijing, China would break out of the military confinement imposed upon it by what's called the first island chain of islands along in the Western Pacific. Beijing is already preparing its military to exploit that eventuality. Second, Taiwan is critical for American credibility in Asia. I stress here that credibility is primarily contextual. If America fails to defend Taiwan, with which it has 70 plus years of history and commitments against China, what does that say for Taiwan's neighbors in Manila, Hanoi, and even Seoul and Tokyo? The problem is that the power balance in Asia is already very competitive between the coalition and China, so even a few defections could spell disaster. So what does America need to do regarding Taiwan? Ensure that we, the Taiwanese and the Japanese in particular, can mount what I call a denial defense of Taiwan, which is also the Pentagon standard, defeating a Chinese invasion or blockade. If China can't conquer Taiwan, then our coalition should stand strong. The problem is we are not currently doing this. In fact, the highly regarded RAND Corporation assessed last year that we are on a trajectory to lose a war over Taiwan and Admiral Paparo, the new Indo-PACOM commander, said a war could start at any time. Nobody <coughs> knows. Public re reports, meantime, indicate that classified wargaming also gives ground for pessimism. Solving this problem is possible, but doing so will require urgent focus, weapons, money, resources, and political capital well beyond what we're now allocating to the problem. Now, how does this relate to Ukraine? Let's be clear, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is an evil act, and Ukraine is fighting a righteous cause in its self-defense. Ukraine deserves our sympathy and our support. But ultimately, our foreign policy must be focused on protecting Americans' own interests. And the fact is that Taiwan's defense is more important to Americans and the situation actually more urgent for us than, than Ukraine's. Why? First, China's a far greater threat than Russia. It's 10 times the GDP of Russia. And China has the world's largest industrial base. It has 200 times the shipbuilding capacity of the United States and continues its historic military buildup, just announced 7.2% increase despite economic headwinds this year. Second, the anti-hegemonic coalition in Asia is in far greater peril than its comparable uh, uh, version is in Europe. NATO and NATO Europe dwarf Russia in economic and thus latent military capacity. Europe can and in fact is now doing much more to handle the Russia threat and support Ukraine, while the coalition in Asia would collapse without much stronger uh, American leadership. Third, while a war is going on in Ukraine, a war could break out with China at any time, and it would very likely directly involve Americans, and we are not prepared. Fortunately, prioritizing Taiwan does not mean abandoning Ukraine, even as it means prioritizing Taiwan. Why is this? Well, first, the United States can and should provide Ukraine 
with weapons and capabilities that it genuinely does not need for Asia. This includes tanks, F-16s, and other systems. And I wrote an article in Time Magazine over the summer for those who are interested. Secondly, Europe can step up, and it's actually now doing so. Europe can provide the money with the willpower and the in with investments the weapons that Ukraine needs. And it can rearm itself to limit the consequences of Russia's reinvigorated military, following the example of Poland, which deserves a lot of credit in this case. This is vital because my view, the Russia threat is real and is not going away. And it, in fact, will likely become worse, especially for our Eastern European allies and partners. But we must be clear that China and Taiwan must be our real priority. Why? Because of scarcity. It's false to say, as the administration does, that we can walk and chew gum. If you look at the fine print from their defense strategy and ours in the Trump administration, we do not have a military that can fight one, more than one serious war at a time. Not because we don't want one, but because we can't because we're falling behind with the Chinese and other threats have also uh, advanced. We, fundamentally, we are unprepared for a Taiwan fight that could cost thousands or more American lives and involve attacks on American territory, including in the homeland. At the same time, Americans are not in the mood for big defense spending increases. And it's not even clear the macroeconomic situation would allow it when debt to GDP is over 100%. Even if we did get big defense spending increases, much of it would be eaten up by organic costs and would take years to bear fruit. And first and foremost, in any case, we need to match his, China's ongoing military buildup, which, as I said, continues despite economic headwinds. So this means that everything, not just Ukraine, but also the Middle East, Latin America, Africa, et cetera, must take a back seat to rectifying our grievously uh, bad situation in the first island chain. For these reasons, America must prioritize Taiwan over Ukraine and everything else. Failing to do so risks great power war, a war that would almost certainly be grievously costly for us and which we might well lose for the first time in our history with disastrous implications. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colby. Professor Snyder. Greetings. Thank you very much to the Buckley Forum for organizing this exchange. Thanks to Mr. Colby for joining us here at Yale. Thanks to all of you for joining in the discussion. By my count, there are still four seats in the front. If you're standing in the back for fitness, that's cool. But if you want to sit, you <laughs> probably could. Um, my claim is that we must reject this proposition for four reasons. The first reason, most straightforward, that we should reject the proposition is that Ukraine should have priority for the basic reason that the war in Ukraine is in fact taking place and engages fundamental American interests. The first of these is nuclear proliferation. Should a conventional power such as Ukraine lose a war having given up its own nuclear weapons, this will encourage nuclear proliferation around the world. This is not speculation. These are statements from our allies as well as from our enemies. The threat of nuclear war is one that we used to regard as serious and ought to now as well. The second American interest is genocide. Regardless of where one stands, one ought to believe that it's wrong to invade another country with the express aim of exterminating its population and rendering its society unfit for existing in the future. That is an American interest as well as a moral one. The third, the entire NATO mission in Europe. For the past three quarters of a century, the United States has dedicated itself to the proposition that war in Europe can be prevented by common action. What we have now is a major war in Europe on the scale of a world war, which is being fought by one country and one country alone. By absorbing Russia's attack, Ukraine is doing what we cannot do. It is preventing Russia at the head of a Chinese coalition from winning a war. It's absorbing an entire Russian attack all by itself. Additionally, Ukrainians are fighting not just for themselves, but for the principle of democracy. An armed attack on a democracy is a very rare thing. Should an armed attack on a major democracy succeed, it seems very likely that there will be a tipping point and democracy will continue to fade around the world. Which is the final point, values. The Ukrainians are taking risks for things that matter. They're taking risks for sovereignty, they're taking risks for democracy. They're taking risks for values. They're doing the things that conservatives say we ought to do. They're putting their bodies on the line for what matters. Letting them down will have major costs in terms of demoralization all around the West and all around the world. The second reason why this proposition must be rejected is that it is self-contradictory. One cannot make Taiwan a higher priority than Ukraine for the simple reason that the best way to prevent a Chinese attack in Taiwan is by making sure that the Ukrainians win. 
And this is, of course, something that the Taiwanese themselves will tell you if you ask. It is also what the Chinese themselves signal very clearly. What the Ukrainians have done in resisting Russian aggression is give us an opportunity for China policy that we could not ourselves have on our own. The Ukrainians can do something that we cannot do. They can demonstrate how difficult offensive operations are without provoking the Chinese. There is not a single measure the United States of America can undertake on its own vis-a-vis -vis China, which will not be read in some way as provocative. The Ukrainians, simply by resisting on their own territory, demonstrate that offensive operations are difficult and thereby make a war with China much, more li much less likely without provoking the Chinese in any way at all. We cannot do that. They can do it with our help. If we don't help them, if we let them go, if we lose the war, if they lose the war, all of this reverses and a Chinese war with all of these consequences that Mr. Colby pointed to becomes much more likely. The Ukrainians have held on for two years. These were the two years when Chinese economic growth began to dip, when American economic growth returned, and when the threat, I think, of the conflict was greatest. The longer the Ukrainians hold on, the less likely it is that we will ever have to face the scenario that Mr. Colby is talking about. The third reason why I believe that we must reject this proposition is that we have to affirm reality. We cannot pursue a kind of pure foreign policy where we wait for exactly the right situation to emerge when we can define that there's a threat of a war with China. China, as Mr. Colby quite rightly says, does not operate on its own. I would extend that point and note that China is not operating on its own right now. Russia's war in Ukraine is only possible thanks to all kinds of sundry Chinese aid. The test of American policy is not taking place in some abstract future when we face an abstract war. It's taking place right now. We are being judged on our policy with respect to Ukraine right now in Beijing and in every capital of every country, whether it's our friends, whether it's our enemies, or whether it's neutral observers. And in this judgment, it's very important to note what matters is not some pure China, but a coalition. Mr. Colby is exactly right. Coalitions are incredibly important. What we have along with the Europeans with respect to Ukraine is a coalition. Insofar as we act within that coalition and take the leading role that we ought to do, that coalition will prevail. The way the Chinese are behaving is also in a coalition a transactional coalition involving, when it matters, the Iranians, the North Koreans, the Russians. The only way to hold back a coalition like that is to recognize it for what it is and to stop it where it can be stopped. And precisely Ukraine gives it an opportunity to be, for it to be stopped. And I'm going to repeat a point here because I think it's very important. In stopping the Russians in Ukraine and demonstrating that offensive operations are very difficult, Ukrainians are doing for us something that we cannot do ourselves. The Ukrainians have given us an opportunity to prevent wider war that we could not afford for ourselves. The last reason why I think this proposition must be rejected is that it is foolish to reject an opportunity. Foreign policy is not made in a vacuum. It's not made on scholarly grounds. One doesn't wait for the perfect opportunity. One has to react to the situation that actually exists in the real world. In the real world, we are facing a horrible war. That horrible war, however, considered geopolitically, provides the United States of America with certain opportunities. Brushing them aside, not taking them seriously, choosing not to turn the situation to your own advantage, I think, is a terrific mistake if what, you can, what you're concerned about are American opportunities. Should you affirm this proposition, should you accept the abstraction, that somehow Taiwan can and should be prioritized over Ukraine. I believe it's logically impossible, by the way, right, for the reason I gave. But should you affirm that proposition, you lose everything we are gaining by supporting the Ukrainians. And you gain exactly nothing. You gain exactly nothing. If you prioritize Taiwan over Ukraine, you lose everything we've gained in the last two years. You throw this world of relative peace and prosperity that the Ukrainians are helping us to get to the wayside for the abstraction of whatever it might mean to prioritize Taiwan. The best way to make sure that Taiwan is safe is to support the Ukrainians. So if you affirm this proposition, you get a better chance of security for both Taiwan 
and for Ukraine, and therefore for the world. Sorry, that was the other way around. If you reject this proposition, right, if you reject this proposition, you get more security for Taiwan and for Ukraine, therefore for the world. If you affirm it, you lose what we're getting for Ukraine, you lose what we're getting for Taiwan, and you throw yourselves into a completely different world. Therefore, I urge rejection. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Snyder. Mr. Colby, brief rebuttal. Great. Well, thank you. There's a, there's a lot there. I think what I would stress to you all is that I did not hear from Pro Professor Snyder any grappling with a couple of the core points that I made. The primacy of Asia, the relatively limited scope and scale of the Russian threat compared to the Chinese threat, the military scarcity that we face, the limitations on our defenses and our, uh, willingness to increase defense spending. I didn't hear any of that. It, the entire presentation, as stirring as it was, appeared to me, to, to turn the, t the phrase back, in the realm of abstraction. What, I would, what, what Professor Snyder calls abstraction, I would call strategy. Would it have made sense for us to expend all of our military forces against Mussolini instead of Hitler, or in Vietnam instead of re uh, doing what President Reagan, and, and actually started by President Carter, in, in restoring our military uh, deterrent in, in Europe? Uh, in fact, in, in, uh, in the Second World War, even though the Japanese bombed us, we said we're going to prioritize the Europeans first. Because Professor Snyder is incorrect in saying that the war is an abstraction. The war, as our military leaders and intelligence leaders, even in this administration, are saying they are preparing for a conflict and it could happen at any time. So I think that is the realm in which we need to talk about reality. Because a lot of the points that he makes, I don't think that this prioritization would, would be without cost. But we need to actually deal in the realm in, in, of, of reality, as he rightly said. So for instance, the Russians are having, even despite having gaining the upper hand in recent months, are having difficulty getting out of the eastern part of Ukraine. Meantime, the Chinese are actively preparing and improving their capability to take over Taiwan, which is central to the first island chain, and are building a military that puts the, the Russians to shame, that will have bases in Cambodia, in the South Pacific, possibly in Oman. A former Yale Law School a classmate of mine had to go to Equatorial Guinea on the west coast of Africa, on the Atlantic, to try to dissuade uh, the Chinese from uh, building a base there. So that is the reality and the scale, and, and I just didn't hear anything about that geopolitical context. Moreover, I would say for everything that Professor Snyder has said, more or less, about the values issue should pertain to, a, uh, uh, I mean, as somebody who's an expert on communist dictatorships, a, uh, a government that is led by a communist dictatorship that avowedly says it would like to snuff out the democracy on Taiwan. So if, I, I don't understand this dismissive attitude towards the potential threat to Taiwan. Finally, the issue of deterring uh, China in Taiwan. Here is the thought experiment I would ask you all uh, to, to take. If China actually believed that it was going to, the, the, the future of Taiwan was going to be settled in Ukraine, why wouldn't it directly intervene in Ukraine? Nobody cares more about the Taiwan issue than Beijing. Instead, what they're doing is what I fear and what I would expect, which is they are depleting and distracting us they are supporting the Russians in a deniable way, and they are building up their capacity to be able to decisively uh, uh, resolve the issue. And Professor Snyder's points about learning that offensive operations uh, don't work, that is not what's happening. Both sides are learning what's going on, but as Bill Burns in this administration has said, the Chinese have not given up at all their objective of taking over Taiwan, as Eli Ratner, the Assistant Secretary for Asia, has said, to eject the Americans from the Western Pacific with enormous geopolitical consequences. What they are trying to figure out is how to do that successfully. And we see them continuing to practice and continuing to make, to make progress. So again, I would stress that, let, let me put it to you this way, and this is a point I've been, made in Washington consistently. Whoever gets into a position of authority in a year is going to have to make very, very difficult decisions and is going to have to communicate the reality that we do not have a two-war military. So if you're going to pursue Professor Snyder's strategy, you are basically talking about sacrificing Taiwan. And here's the thing, if you do that, that is not going to make the problem go away. That is actually going to make an Asia pivot all the, all, the, all the more drastic. Because if the Chinese move and we are defeated, we will have to drop everything. And then the Europeans will really be in bad shape. So I would say let's prioritize Taiwan now. As soon as we can, the war could happen at any time. Nobody knows it could happen in 2027, it could happen tomorrow, it could happen in five years. It may never happen. But we have to be prepared, and that is the that is the, is the essence of strategy. That is not an abstraction. Professor Snyder, it is precisely because one takes China seriously that one takes Ukraine seriously. 
This is not the only reason to take Ukraine seriously. There is also international law, genocide, fulfilling the NATO mission, democracy, defense of values. There are many other reasons to take Ukraine seriously. But precisely because Mr. Colby is right that China is so important, one has to take Ukraine seriously and not overlook the opportunity that it affords. Yes, China is very important. Yes, we want to avoid a war with China. Therefore, one does several things with respect to Ukraine, which makes that war both less likely and more winnable. Number one, you always leverage what you have in the real world. The Ukrainian economy is one 250th as big as the NATO economies. Nevertheless, on the basis of that one 250th, the Ukrainians, with some moderate help, have been able to hold back a Russia which is helped by Iran, North Korea, and China. When you have a situation like that, you leverage it. Secondly, you take advantage of a situation where you can gain and win without provoking the other side. The Ukrainians have the superpower, which Mr. Colby has not mentioned, that they can do things that have an effect on China and the entire world without provoking China. There is nothing the United States can do in this confrontation which will not be read as provocative in Beijing and which is not in that sense risky. The Ukrainians can hold back this coalition with our help without provoking Beijing. The third thing which is worth noting is that American weapons are being tested, and I would submit that the, the Americans who are learning the most from the testing in a live war in Ukraine. That is happening right now. We're testing weapon systems against weapon systems, the same weapon systems where the Chinese have bought from the Russians. Perhaps more to the point, the very weapons which can hold back a Chinese naval-based um, invasion of Taiwan, naval drones, are being developed by our allies, the Ukrainians, themselves. We let the Ukrainians go. We never get that techn technology. Taiwan goes unprotected by sea drones. Letting, having the Ukrainians win is the best way to make sure that this war does not happen, right? Which is what we all want. It's the best way to make sure that the Chinese can be deterred. There is no tension in that argument from deterrence with the argument that should such a war arise, we want to win it. But again, being on Ukraine's side is also the best way to make sure that such, it should such a horrifying scenario arise, the United States could win. Thank you. Thank you both. We will now move into a round of open questions. Uh, please specify who your question is for, Mr. Colby, Professor Snyder, or both. Thank you. Um, this is for uh, Mr. Colby. Um, with the dichotomy uh, restraint versus um, taking a proactive action versus China, um, there is an argument that says that China uh, tries a number of things, whether it's uh, massive investment in electric vehicles, um, massive investments in its state-owned enterprises that uh, eventually never um, pan out or don't become fruitful. Um, isn't there an argument for um, uh, taking a more restraint uh, stance and seeing how things work out? Uh, ex excellent question. What I would say is actually my own view is speak softly and carry a big stick. So on the issues of, of policy issues, including mm -hmm. economic sanctions and ideological warfare and so forth and rhetoric, I tend to be more dovish actually on China because I'm so worried about a, a war with China that I don't believe we should essentially poke a dragon when we are in position of weakness and when Xi Jinping is telling our president that we are strangling them. So I think the prospects of war are very real. What I would say in response to what Professor Snyder has said is, I, with, with all due respect, there's a kind of triple bank shot logic here, which is, as Napoleon said, who knew something about the topic, if you want to take Vienna, take Vienna. If you want to deter and defeat China, be prepared to deter and defeat China. And there's this argument about Ukraine and so forth. The Chinese are not behaving that way. The Chinese are assiduously preparing. And here's the problem. If I take their perspective as I understand it, which is that they are insisting on unification with Taiwan, and that they, and for rational reasons, they want to become the ascendant in Asia. They're not saying that explicitly, but certainly reading th uh, through the lines, that's what you can tell. There is no peaceful solution to that world. The, the Taiwanese just elected the DPP for a third straight term, the Indo independence-leaning party. Countries throughout the region and beyond are raising tariff barriers and resisting Chinese uh, 
uh, sort of bullying. I mean, apropos of what Professor Schneider was saying, the Chinese are not being deterred. They're water cannoning the Phil Philippines right in their face. They're going across the median line in Taiwan. They're, they're, doing all they're stopping uh, boats around uh, Kimo uh, Kinmen, for instance. So they are being, they're, they're putting themselves in a position to act militarily. And I think the critical thing we need to do, and we cannot deceive or delude ourselves with sort of high-minded arguments, we need to have the military forces there to make it a worthwhile effort. Because, and, and, and the Taiwanese in particular, despite what they're saying, and I, I recognize that the Taiwanese say this, and I actually get in arguments with them, but I would say we shouldn't always believe our allies. Should we have believed Ashraf Ghani when he said, oh, everything's fine in Afghanistan? Should we have believed the Ukrainians themselves when they said the Russians weren't going to attack? Should we, you know, should our allies have believed us when we said the Ukrainians were going to fall apart? No. Nobody has a monopoly on wisdom. But what we, the Americans, can see is historic, ongoing military buildup, even in the face of economic headwinds. And, and despite these economic headwinds, Xi Jinping is continuing to take costly measures to make his economy more resilient to the potential for economic sanctions. Why would he do that? So I don't think there's really the peaceful, uh, growing sort of uh, rise to superpowerdom you're talking about. But what I'm worried about is then they'll reach for the military instrument. Gentlemen, thank you both. Professor Snyder, a question for you. Uh, for us to believe that Ukraine is going to have a deterrent effect on the Chinese government, we have to have a model of how the Chinese government thinks. I think we've heard a little from Mr. Colby about uh, the evidence and the actions that the Chinese government is taking that make him think the Chinese are not deterred. Could you talk a little bit more like specifically about uh, what the Chinese are doing that makes you think this uh, Ukraine issue is actually deterring them. Sure. So I'm, I'm going to I'm going to try to address the question directly and then hold back on direct engagement until we actually get through that because I understand there'll be final remarks. I'm going to try to a answer questions as they're as they're posed. Um, I'm going to make the uh, the uh, several several different kinds of claims here. The first, which is not for me at all banal is that there has not been a war in the last two years. The, the nightmare scenario in February of 2022, if one remembers, is that a quick Russian victory or quick Russian success in Ukraine will enable China to act quickly in the Pacific. That was the nightmare scenario as broadly aired by the US foreign policy establishment among both Democrats and Republicans. So I submit the fact, I submit that the fact that the Russia, Russia's engagement in Ukraine did not lead to a three-day victory and instead has led to a long, prolonged, um, and highly costly adventure seems to, by the initial shared logic of everyone involved, have reduced a risk which we all believed was there. The second bit of logic, um, again, if we're going to if we're going to cite Napoleon and, and Bismarck and the and the classics of war. Uh, people are deterred on the basis, regardless of who they are, on the basis of what they think the costs are going to be. The, the model for both Ukraine and Taiwan was a sort of blitz. The more time goes on in Ukraine, the less likely any kind of blitz success seems to everyone concerned. And again, I would, I would tend to trust what our allies and our enemies both say on this, on this point. With respect to the Chinese politically, because it's a communist party, as Mr. Colby quite rightly says, with no established succession principle, um, dependent for legitimacy or support on things like economic growth and stability, it is highly risk averse and would tend to take steps like this when it thinks they would be easy to accomplish. Uh, it's possible that China could take Taiwan, but the longer this war goes on in Ukraine, the more difficult it proves to be for Russia. And to repeat a point I made before, um, the more technologies that are developed which would hold China back, I think the less likely it is the Chinese Communist Party, precisely because it's a Chinese Communist Party, would risk an embarrassment. Their sort of power looks durable, but is subject to embarrassment in a way that democratic systems are not. 
My question is for Mr. Snyder, and it is the general kind of consen consensus is that Russia and Putin are evil, but do you think that NATO and the U.S. bear any responsibility in this war, seeing as Putin has vehemently been against NATO expansion eastward? Obviously, you know, the CIA had a hand in the 2014 coup, and we've been expanding our interest eastward. So do you think there are any lessons that we can take away from our previous foreign policy that we can apply to avoid future conflicts? NATO enlargement is itself a misnomer. NATO is not something that enlarges. NATO is a union of states which petition to join. The idea that there is a NATO which seeks enlargement is something which we take in without thinking about it. In every case where a country joins NATO, it is because that country seeks to join NATO. When we speak of NATO enlargement, what we are generally doing is we are suppressing, discarding, and ignoring the sovereign wishes of the people who live in these countries who have chosen governments that bring them into the NATO alliance. There are reasons which have to do with the lived experience of Estonians, Poles, and all the rest, why those countries have chosen to join NATO. So before I even engage um, with the factual part of your question, I just want to point out that this very notion of NATO expansion is quite problematic because what it does is push under the rug the actions, the votes, the desires, and the fears of human beings and imagines instead an institution which had a policy of enlargement. It did not. NATO did not have a policy of enlargement. It was the East Europeans which forced enlargement to happen. So on the factual part of the question, um, you're mistaken that, that Vladimir Putin has consistently opposed NATO enlargement until very late in the day, he regarded it as a matter of indifference and said so on the record over and over again. For the citations, you can look at my book, Road to Unfreedom. Um, you're also mistaken that a coup took place in Ukraine in 2014. In 2014, with Russian assistance, a pro-Russian president assassinated around 100 peaceful protesters, leading to a situation in which he, with Russian help, fled the, fled the country, after which the parliament elected an acting president and after which presidential elections were held. So the, the, re the, the regime in Ukraine is a constitutional one. Um, and as for, the, as for the CIA having some role in those events, um, there's no reason at all to think that that's true. As for what our policy could have been to prevent the Russian war, I think the conclusion one draws is rather the opposite. Russia hasn't invaded any NATO countries. Russia has invaded countries like Georgia and Ukraine that are not in NATO. Had we taken the Russians seriously when they told us what they were going to do, I think it'd be less likely we're in the predicament that we are now. Thank you for the question. You, 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 no, you, you do for the, for, the for the recording. Oh, for the recording? Oh. Yeah. Uh, thank you both. My question is for Mr. Colby. Sure. The issue of Taiwan and the, Taiwa the Taiwan question vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis China has been around since 1949. It's gone through multiple phases, th you know, three Taiwan Strait crises uh, from an aggressive policy to a policy of peaceful unification. To me, it seems that this is a chronic issue that needs to be dealt with in a long run strategy. And to me, it seems that you are proposing a very acute response to an immediate emergency. My question is, how do you reconcile that long run history of the Taiwan question with your proposal for an immediate reprioritization of the Taiwan Very straightforward answer issue? to that, which is that for the first time in 70 years, the Chinese can successfully invade at Taiwan in the face of US resistance. I've said, been in briefings where former heads of you know, Pacific Command would say, we could swat the, Ta the Chinese away, or if you look at the record uh, in the Rand Corporation scorecard report from 2015, Mao Zedong was preparing to invade Taiwan when the Korean War broke out and the US put the 7th Fleet. Mao settled the Chinese Civil War through direct use of military force, huge uh, milita uh, battles in Manchuria, the invasion of Hainan Island, the occupation of Tibet, for instance. So the Chinese, even if their strategic culture, if you buy all that sort of stuff, they will use military force. The thing that rebuts your point, sir, is actually the Chinese themselves have been building that military. They are building, they have the world's largest navy now. They have the world's largest missile force. They have a huge space force. They are practicing invasion and blockade operations. That is what's changed. And I would just say, I think we can't, I mean, uh, with respect, I, I, like just because the, the, the invasion hasn't happened yet, people talk about 2027. I think that's a real issue. Xi Jinping has said to the PLA, I want you to be ready to invade Taiwan by 2027. That's not a prediction, but it's pretty suggestive. 
right? And he's a guy, he's a Leninist, right? He's not necessarily going to give us exactly the timeline. He, there's deception involved here, obviously, especially if you're dealing with a, with a, 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 a cross-channel invasion. And I think that the, the, the thing that our intelligence community, Bill Burns, a, 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 someone who's very close to President Biden, a Biden appointee, he has said the Chinese have not given up on the desire to take over Taiwan. What they are learning is go big or go home. Don't make the mistake, thank goodness, that Putin made by underestimating the Ukrainians. I mean, not thank goodness, it's an incredibly tragic event. But he's not going to make that mistake. And that's what it looks like they are preparing to do. Their nuclear buildup is also consistent with that. And I don't think that we can assume that Xi Jinping is risk averse. This is a man who has taken more personal risk, in my view, or at least comparably as much personal risk, uh, to ascend the ladder of the Chinese Communist Party and purge opponents like Bo Xi Lai and the anti-corruption campaign, then that we would not kill him because that would be nuclear war if we got into a war, right? So this, I don't think this man is, risk, I don't think we have a basis for saying this man is risk averse. And here's the problem. It's chronic in a sense like acute, like heart disease. But if you get the heart attack, you're dead. And we have to have, the, I, I disagree in terms of what deterrence is. Deterrence, yes, can come through cost imposition if you have an advantage in resolve. And unfortunately, we don't have an advantage in resolve vis-a-vis -vis China over Taiwan. What we need is denial. We need the weapons, the capability, the money, the positioning, the readiness, et cetera. And we don't have that. And that, this is actually, this is, it sounds, it sounds kind of banal and boring and, oh, this is military stuff or whatever. No, no, no. Think about 1940. If you wanted to defeat Hitler, you had to put, you didn't leave the Ardennes open. It, ca it came down to sim simple military operational things like that. We have to get that right, or we could lose. And if the Chinese take Taiwan as only the beginning of the problems, and Europe, in fact, and Ukraine are going to be in far worse shape, actually. Thanks. This is for Professor Snyder. Um, there's an idea that I think you've presented that. Um, defending Ukraine is actually a really good way of deterring China from invading Taiwan. That China, for example, is maybe looking at the Ukraine war, seeing that it's taking a long time and thinking, we don't want to get bogged down, uh, a blitz strategy won't work. What I guess I'm not really understanding is, if our goal is to deter an invasion of Taiwan, why would there be any better way of doing that than simply investing militarily in Taiwan to the maximum that we can? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because the best way to invest in the defense of Taiwan is to take the entire world into account and take into account what's actually happening in that world. So the notion of let's just look at Taiwan and give them weapons sounds fine, but and I have no objection to it at all, nor with the Taiwanese. But what the Taiwanese would have an objection to would be the proposition, let us prioritize Taiwan over Ukraine which is the proposition under debate. Within that larger notion of priorities, we go wrong. Because then we, if we affirm that proposition, because then we throw away the additional gains that one gets from Ukraine. Your question assumes that there's some kind of hard choice to be made here, that one must sacrifice the Ukrainians in order to help the Taiwanese, when the opposite is the case. The more we help the Ukrainians, the more we help the Taiwanese for a number of reasons. Number one, um, as Mr. Colby quite rightly says, a lot of this hangs on credibility. Around the world, everyone thinks that Ukraine should be an easy win for us for very good reasons. Should we not have this easy win, pretty much no one will think that we will be able to do anything about Taiwan. Number two, as I've mentioned before, weapons preparation. Not a highfalutin issue, a very operational one. If one wants to know how Chinese systems work, one observes how Russian systems work because they're very often the same systems. If one wants to pre pre prevent a seaborne invasion, one looks at what the Ukrainians are doing in the Black Sea and makes sure that they can continue to do it, right? So even if you don't care about Ukraine at all, and that would be a very sad conclusion to come to because there are so many reasons to care about Ukraine in and of itself. Even if you care a lot about Taiwan, you ought to care about genocide you ought to care about international order, you ought to care about nuclear proliferation, all things which the Ukrainians are helping us with, separate from this debate about Taiwan. But even if all you cared about was Taiwan, you wouldn't think, oh, there's some kind of false binary choice and I have to do one or the other. You would, you would say, in this world where we are, in terms of both coalitions and the military, in terms of both deterrence and denial, you would want to be doing both. You want to seize the opportunities that you have from Ukraine and apply them. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you both for coming. I had a question for, for both of you uh, regarding the sort of fallout um, if you know Taiwan were to be taken over or Ukraine were to be taken over. Holistically, I think we've talked a lot about the strategy and the implications of the wars themselves, but I'd love to know a little bit about the impact of the war more broadly, geopolitically, maybe what would be the next step. Both of these, uh, both of these countries are obviously former uh, parts of you know, the Soviet Union or, or China, and um, I'd just love to know where you think the, uh, Russia and China would go um, in the future after uh, invading and, let's say, winning in, in their relative uh, battles or wars. No, thanks. That's an excellent question. I mean, the consequences of a Chinese victory over Taiwan are far greater than a Russian victory over Ukraine. And to be clear, I don't favor abandoning the Ukrainians. I, I favor providing XX articles and, and the like, and also shifting more of the burden to the Europeans who are capable and are now stepping up to do more to support Ukraine. But if you look at the geography and the power level of the countries in question, China is a peer superpower of the United States. In fact, it has a far larger industrial base than the United States does. It's, you know, in purchasing power parity terms, it's actually a larger economy. It's, Taiwan is located right in the middle of the, of the first island chain. There's not a lot out there in the Pacific. If the Chinese break out of that, they have the, the power base, and they're already developing the military with aircraft carriers, space architecture, power projection forces, bases, et cetera, to exploit that. And I think we could assume that they would do so because it would be advantageous. And if we look at our own behavior, that's very likely to happen. Meantime, the Russians, as I said, are having difficulty. And I think Professor Snyder's right about the incredible fighting capability and spirit of the Ukrainians. The Russians, th their military has been heavily attrited. I think it will re resuscitate and become more dangerous over time, and it will be a significant threat to Eastern Europe. But the Russians are not going to get to the, the Rhine, let alone the Channel. I mean, the Poles are there. The Poles are very serious military. The Finns, a serious military. The Romanians are spending more. The Germans finally seem to be getting their act in, in gear. The French and the British, et cetera. So there's a lot of buffer there. So the consequences are, are much worse. And I'll stress something that even if you're European, if the Chinese are victorious and you care about all the issues that I think Professor Schneider rightly does care about, if China dominates Asia, it's going to be the dominant power of the world. It's going to be the gatekeeper and hegemon of Asia, and everybody else is going to accommodate, right? So in that world, the Russians are going to be privileged as well. That's part of why they have such a close relationship. But the fact that they have a close relationship actually means that we need to prioritize even more because we have to assume that they would act collaboratively to distract and deplete us. And honestly, that's what's happening. In the Middle East, whether or not the Chinese are actually behind it actively or not, they are clearly benefiting from a situation in which in the Middle East, we fired a whole year's worth. And again, this sounds banal, but it's really important. We fired a year's worth of, I think it was either SM6s or Tomahawks at the Houthis. I mean, in Yemen, right? So it's not just that Ukraine's the problem. Ukraine is not the source of the problem, but we are in a condition of scarcity and hard choices absolutely do exist. Money, people are not in favor of dramatically increasing defense spending. Look at Republicans, too, in the House. Both presidential candidates are saying Social Security you know, cuts are pretty much off the table, as I understand it. So there is scarcity. Weapons like air defense, like intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and a range of other capabilities that we're already behind on, and that we need to, to, we are in a hole, and we need to stop digging. And I think, sir, your question was exactly right, is that that's the way that we, so even I think if you actually care about the issue, which we all should, the issues that Professor Snyder raises, even then, you should not want China to dominate Asia. And then, and then Taiwan becomes the priority, not to zero out uh, the Ukraine issue, but a genuine priority. OK, so the question was to both of us. Sorry, so give me a sec. Um, so I, my, my second point I'm going to repeat, which is that I don't think you can affirm this proposition because it's contradictory. So the question is about what do we expect if China takes Taiwan, what do you expect if Russia takes Ukraine? One of the things we can expect if Russia takes Ukraine is that China takes Taiwan, right? So if you are concerned about the one, you have to be concerned about the other. The, the converse isn't true because of the world that we're in. There is actually a war taking place in Ukraine now, which will have consequences for Taiwan. That's logical because it's chronological, right? So if, you're, if you care about China and Taiwan, the first thing you have to be concerned about is, you, is Ukraine right now. Um, on the question of what happens, Mr. Colby mentioned France in 1940. France in 1940, the beginning of the Second World War, the loss of what was supposed to be, the defeat of what was supposed to be the greatest army in Europe, uh, the largest army in Europe, was largely a matter of morale. It largely had to do with the notion that democracy had already failed, that there wasn't really anything in particular to fight for. Should we let the Ukrainians lose, that is the demoralization that we are inviting unto ourselves. 
Now we have a country before our eyes that is taking risks, people your age, Mr. Colby's age, my age, losing life and limb every day because they're trying to preserve democracy. If we let them lose, it is extremely unlikely that any democracy, including ours, is going to have the morale, is going to have the will to do anything about the enormous challenges that Mr. Colby quite rightly describes in China. So if we let them win in Ukraine, we will not, it's not that just we'll lose, we won't even be in a position to try. And even were we in a position to try, we would not have the credibility to do so. This, as, as both of us, I believe, agreed and have said a number of times, all of this involves coalitions. If the United States allows Ukraine to lose, which everyone sees, as I repeat, as an easy victory for the West, because of GDP, because of our obvious interests, because of the obvious ideological alignment, if we allow Ukraine to lose, we have zero credibility building a coalition anywhere else. And without a coalition, there's no practical hope of preventing, deterring, or denying China in, in any way. And again, if we let Ukraine lose, there is a set of considerations of consequences which are independent of Taiwan, which are worth repeating. Number one is nuclear proliferation. The Ukrainians gave up nuclear weapons in, a in, in, in return for security assurances. If, a, if they lose a conventional war to a nuclear power, other mid-sized states are going to build nuclear weapons, which puts us in a much more dangerous world. Another consequence is loss of respect for international law. It is not so usual for one state to try to destroy another state in blatant violation of the international consensus that, that reigned since 1948. And the third consequence is genocide. Um, we will have a very large-scale genocide on our conscience, and not another large-scale genocide will become a, present in the, a precedent in the 21st century. And to get right down to some of the most important questions, um, Ukraine is of interest to the Russians, not just for the you know, mostly false reasons that Putin gives, but also because Ukraine can feed half a billion people. The Ukrainians, by winning the Battle of Black Sea, are feeding Africa and feeding the Near East right now, thereby preventing conflict in those regions. Allow Russia control over Ukrainian agriculture, prospect, and you can expect blackmail and conflict. Ukraine also has lots of rare earths. They have lots of resources that are of great interest to the West, which we will miss if we don't have access to them. So whether you're concerned about the highest things, the values of democracy, or the most everyday things, the economic resources, the consequences will be enormous if we allow Ukraine to lose. I'm very happy to see there's more questions, but to be respectful of everybody's time, we'll have to move on to our closing statement. So uh, we will begin the closing statement in reverse order. So Professor Snyder, um, your s closing statement. Oh, okay. That's sort of funny. I feel like I should have like <laughs> like gone to another room and like we should have like been in the green room for a minute and like <laughs> taken off our tie. Okay, I'm not wearing a tie. Um, uh, it's because it's just funny to sort of bounce right back up again. Okay, I'm not wearing a tie. I will, I will start with that. I thought about wearing a tie because I know how beloved old guys in ties are to, you know, to conservatives. So <laughs> I um, uh, could have worn a bow tie. <laughs> yeah, like, like some, the other, like, there were like literally, you can't see this on camera, but there are literally young women blushing right now. Okay. Uh, uh, so I'm not, I'm not wearing a tie, and I'm not wearing a tie because I hate ties, but I'm also not wearing a tie because I thought for this debate I would wear the clothes that I wore the last time I was in a deoccupied zone of Ukraine. Um, these are the shoes I was wearing. These are the dust that's on these shoes. It's a dust which was on soil, which the Ukrainians have deoccupied, liberated from the Russians. Where Ukraine liberates territory from Russia, there is no longer torture. Where Ukraine liberates territory from Russia, local elites are no longer executed. Where Ukraine liberates territory from Russia, children are no longer kidnapped. Where Ukraine liberates territory from Russia, there is a chance of people having a decent life. I will speak about the strategy in the long term of all of this, but I'm going to insist that in the world where we are now, we make a grave mistake, a fundamental mistake, if we forget about basic things like human decency. If we forget that people fight for the value of living a decent life. If we turn away from that, if we react only to abstractions, if we find ourselves making arithmetical calculations which don't make sense on their own, but which also deny the humanity and agency of people who depend upon us, we will not only lose in a strategic sense, we will lose in a moral sense. Now, when it comes to the strategy, what I've tried to do is make the case, and again, responding to your important question, there is not a hard choice to be made here. 
we can choose to deprioritize Ukraine. If we deprioritize Ukraine, we therefore also deprioritize Taiwan. If we decide that we're going to make ourselves less credible and less strong with respect to Ukraine, we also make ourselves less credible and less strong with respect to Taiwan. There is not a hard choice to be made, therefore. There is a very easy choice to be made. Should you care about preserving international law? Should you care about halting genocide? Should you care about reducing the risk of nuclear proliferation? Should you care about reducing the risk of war in Europe? For all of those reasons, you would care to prioritize Ukraine. But should you agree with Mr. Colby, as I do, that China is an enormous threat and a risk of war with China is something we must keep in mind, one would also come to the conclusion, as I repeat, the Taiwanese themselves repeatedly do, that it is time to prioritize Ukraine, both for reasons having to do with the most pragmatic testing and developing weapons, which can be used against the Chinese op offensive operation, uh, for, again, for the most pragmatic and down-to-earth, deterring the Chinese as well as developing the instruments which allow us to deny the Chinese, but also um, for, for, for the reasons which are, which, are, which are most important to looking towards the future, namely that when you affirm a priority for Ukraine, everyone around the world knows that you're capable of affirming some kind of priority. Because however we look at ourselves, should we choose now to deprioritize Ukraine? There is no one beyond the United States of America who will think that we are in the position to prioritize anything at all. Thank you very much. Well, let me just say it's, it's been a, an honor, and uh, the topic is very heavy, but of course, but uh, a, a pleasure uh, to have this debate. I think it's, uh, you've seen the issues hopefully really be joined, and I, I myself have found myself stirred by a lot of what Professor Snyder says. I think, let me, let me be direct with all of you. Um, I'm very worried about a war with China, uh, not because I think they are necessarily evil, some of them may be, not because I'm, I'm spoiling for a war. I desperately do not want a war with China, both because including many of you or many of you watching on the screen, might be involved in it, whether in combat or here at home. The Chinese have the capability. And so uh, they are actively preparing for it. The assessment from our government, even under a democratic administration, is that they're actively preparing for it. Nobody knows. But Professor Snyder referred to arithmetical calculations. And I think that you see the difference. And if you were, let's say all of you were in, in, in office in January 2025, whether you're Democrats or Republicans, could you follow Professor Snyder's advice and do the best for the American people? My view is that we need to be able to put those Americans who might, God forbid, be called upon to fight the, most form the, the country that has undertaken the most formidable peacetime military buildup in generations, we need to give them every possible advantage. And we have not done so despite a lot of rhetoric. And it sounds banal. It sounds like, oh, something happened on the Meuse or the Germans broke through in the Ardennes. These kinds of things can have catastrophic consequences these kinds of breakthroughs if you are not adequately prepared, and we're not. And the, the scarcity, there is a choice, unfortunately. There are hard choices. I mean, Paul Jagot of the Wall Street Journal says, oh, we can def raise defense spending easily. Well, if it had been so easy, why didn't it happen 15 years ago? It hasn't happened again and again and again. I don't think Americans want to raise taxes or cut government entitlement programs. I, people might want it to be otherwise, but it's not. And by the way, even if we do spend more on defense, it's going to take years to, to fix our defense industrial base, which is overly financialized. There's subcomponent problems. A lot of our supply chains go back to China. This is the problem. If you were put in a position where you were in a position of responsibility in January 2025, could you actually? I don't think so. I don't think you could responsibly do that. And let me make a point about morality, because I think this is very important, and I accept a lot of what Professor Snyder is saying. I would say my way is the more, is the more moral way. Why? Because it is more moral to be prudent and to, and to have a good plan. I don't think it is actually more moral to say we're going to hope, and I'm not suggesting this, but we're just going to hope that Chinese aren't going to attack. I think if we know that there is a possibility that we could have the heart attack, we need to have pre pre prepare for it. And if, and if it's your friend, you're all, you guys are all young, but if, or most of you are young, if your friend has got a cancer diagnosis, you tell him, go get chemo. You don't say, don't worry, oh, you'll be fine. You're not going to have heart attack. You, it's, that would be immoral. And I think that is, the, that is the way that I would stress that we should think about this and that we cannot ignore the reality of scarcity and choice. And again, let me stress that that doesn't mean abandoning Ukraine. I mean, that's general. I'm not trying to duck the issue. 
I think there are things we can provide at a, at a considerably lower level, but in particular what the Europeans are doing, and that's part of the reason to be clear sooner rather than later, because the Europeans are now finally getting the message that they need to do more, and you know what, they're doing it. That's a, I think that's a better way of doing it, which is telling them we can't do everything ourselves anymore, so you have to do your part. So to me, that's the best way to account for the problem. And I think at the end of the day, even people who, care, who are putting, you know, who are, who are in Professor Snyder's camp, you don't want the Chinese to dominate Asia. You care about international law. You care about nuclear proliferation. By the way, we made the Taiwanese give up nuclear weapons several times, and the South Koreans. And the people always talk about a latent Japanese nuclear program. So there are tough choices everywhere. I'm not saying this is a good choice. I wish we'd been, I've been arguing against this, this kind of our foreign policy for the last 10 or 15 years, even more. But here we are, and we have to live in the realm of reality. I think Professor Snyder and I agree about that. But I think as an American, our foreign policy has got to be common sense, practical realism. And that is not only more pragmatic and realistic, it's more moral. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you all for coming to today's event. Uh, just a reminder that if you are interested at all in seeing more events like this one, please consider becoming a Buckley Fellow at www.buckleyinstitute.com. And before we leave, please join me in another round of applause for our guests. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.